Hello and welcome back. Some say it's not the job of monetary policy makers to provide jobs or care about inequality, that those tasks lie with governments instead. Yet, while wealth and income distribution may well lie outside the policy makers' ambit, they can have a substantial impact on monetary policy transmission. Whether or not they're responsible for it then, central banks need to care about these topics. That is going to be the theme of this coming session. I now want to introduce the chair, Philip Lane of the ECB's executive board. Mr Lane, over to you. Good afternoon and welcome to this panel. The connection between monetary policy and employment has to be one of the longest running topics in, in economics. And this is really fundamental, I suppose, to our day to day business in understanding how monetary policy works. Uh, this is for several reasons. One reason is the way we think uh, inflation dynamics are maintained uh, over the medium term, especially is really through the labour market. That it's very difficult to have uh, inflation at 2% in the medium term unless we have a sufficient uh, rate of wage inflation, which taken into account productivity is consistent with a 2% inflation target. So that's a very basic reason. A second reason, and it's the most basic reason for our medium term perspective, is we know there can be adverse supply shocks in the economy which, which push inflation and employment in opposite directions. And to allow us to manage that conflict, that trade-off, we take a medium-term perspective. Now, the reason why we've brought together the topics of monetary policy, employment and inequality into this session is that uh, once you spend any amount of time thinking about it, is that the relation between employment and monetary policy has to depend on the nature of the very many different types of inequality we have in, the, in society and in the labour market. So people are different along many dimensions. Uh, skill level, education level, uh, the sector they work in, as we know from the pandemic, by age group, by gender, by income, by wealth. And all of those dimensions may have a role to play in understanding the interconnections between monetary policy, uh, employment and employment. So at the very least, uh, we need to take this into account in order to have a good model of how monetary policy works. Of course, when we take monetary policy actions, uh, regardless of their effect on inflation and employment, uh, these policies may have an effect along some of those inequality dimensions. And for transparency, and accountability, we should be clear about uh, those side effects. In addition, uh, in relation uh, to this topic, inequality may also matter for other reasons. For example, uh, we think inequality of income and of wealth may play a role in determining the underlying equilibrium real interest rate, which of course is, is a big topic for a central bank. Now, uh, I'm very pleased today that we've brought together a really excellent panel all of the panel members are really working at the intersection of macroeconomics and uh, labour economics, which is what you need for this topic. Let me emphasise also all, all three contributors are also very much uh, dedicated to, to, to a, a type of research which we find very helpful in central banks, which is to, to focus on quantitative implications that it's not enough to have some kind of partial understanding or qualitative understanding of these forces. We need to be able to understand the quantitative contribution of different dimensions to weigh up the different elements. So our pa panel today uh, ha has three very distinguished academics. W Juan de Lado will speak first uh, from Carlos Tercera in Madrid, then Antonella Trigari from Bocconi and finally Gianluca Violante from Princeton. So each will have 10 minutes for, for opening uh, presentations and then we, we'll turn to a discussion. And of course, let me remind uh, the, the uh, 
uh, audience. In, in terms of raising your hand, you can join the queue to ask questions or make comments in what I'm sure is going to be a very good discussion. So with that, over to you, Juan. Thank you, Philip, for your kind introduction and good afternoon to all participants. Uh, the topic uh, I wanted to address in my introductory remarks is uh, whether uh, inequality should be a concern for monetary policy. Uh, this topic is becoming uh, increasingly relevant and increasingly popular in the academic uh, 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 literature. Basically, of course, because of the long-standing trend in, in the concerns for, for inequality since the, since the 80s, uh, which were aggravated by the unequal outcomes of the recovery of the, of the Great Recession, and in, a, in, 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 in macro modeling by the growing influence of uh, micro-level heterogeneity, acknowledging that we are not all the same, and the search and matching friction uh, uh, framework, which introduces endogenous risk. Uh, faced by different individuals. So this has put inequality at the center stage. Uh, the, uh, the, the, for instance, just to give you an example, the, the, ECB, the recently released ECB work stream report on employment devotes, as Philip was saying, a large section to the implication of uh, inequality for the conduct of monetary policy. So here we have two views. The traditional view is that distributional issues shouldn't be considered as relevant for central bank policies. They are side effects because the goal of central bank policy is to stabilize the economy as a, as a whole, and I emphasize that. The alternative view, which is being put forward uh, more recently, is that monetary policy, which I denote by MP, could have non-negligible direct effects on inequality at the business cycle frequencies, which interacts with the other channels of the monetary policy mechanism. To keep in line with the current stance of monetary policy in the, in the sequel, in the following slides, I'm going to focus on the impact of expansionary monetary policy on inequality rather than contractionary, which is the, what most people believe cause uh, higher inequality. So to remind you of the main channels through which uh, expansionary monetary shock, think of a uh, sudden uh, cut in interest rates, affects inequality, I'm going to summarize them in five categories. The savings redistribution channel, which benefits borrowers and hard lenders, so one can think that uh, that will reduce inequality. The interest sensitivity channel, lower interest rate, higher asset pr prices, higher inflation, the former favors the richer, the second harms the poorer, that increases inequality. The household firm heterogeneity channel, so uh, expansion in monetary policy may ease access to financial markets, may affect intertemporal rates of substitution, may benefit mortgages, small young firms, so we think that that tends to decrease inequality. The income composition channel, so is how different uh, sources of income, wages, salaries, uh, profits, uh, transfers, change uh, with expansionary monetary policy. Here we have ambiguous effect. And the labor earnings at the United Channel, which depends on skill, education levels, uh, and occupations. And I'm, I'm going to argue that that one could be worsened by, by expansionary monetary policy. Just to give you a, a simple uh, representation of the findings uh, which have been uh, reported in, in, in the recent literature. Uh, this is, let me just uh, look at the uh, point to this graph, which is from a paper by Anderson et al., which uses very highly granular information. They have individual level tax records and balance sheets for the entire adult population in Denmark over a long period. And what they do is they simulate the changes in the income shares according to the exante position in the in the income distribution uh, for a 100 basis points uh, cut in interest rates which in Denmark is a, sort of a, an exogenous event since the crown is a peg to the euro so they, they inherit whatever happening what is ever, ever happening with the with the with the euro rate so what you can see in this graph very clearly is that there is what i call a positive income gradient 
the, 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 the upper part of the income distribution, of the exante income distribution, gains in share about 3.5%, whereas the lower part loses about 2%. Uh, 2%. So this, this is the phenomenon that I want to draw your attention to. So uh, let me just summarize a, a very, uh, 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 I think, a, a very logic channel which has been somewhat unexplored in the monetary policy mechanism, which is the role of investment. So I'm going to rely here on results from a recent paper with uh, Gergo Motioski and Evi Papa. Well, just to simplify matters, think of a world a tank model to to, to agents, so that we have high-skilled individuals and less-skilled individuals. So a key issue here is that uh, capital, which is, of course, uh, increased by a reduction in interest rates or by quantitative easing, uh, exhibits uh, skill complementarity. So think that capital equipment and uh, high-skilled workers are complements, and capital equipment and low-skilled workers are substitutes. For instance, this is the famous uh, production function advocated by Gianluca and co-authors. Uh, but this, the reasoning I'm going to give you is very similar if we think of investment in artificial intelligence, robots, or the, and the decline of routine tasks along the lines of Hachemoglu and Restrepo. So that's one element. Capital is, increases the, produ the marginal productivity of some type of labor and decreases the marginal productivity of the other type of labor, and vice versa. And second is that the search and matching frictions are not the same for both types of workers. So typically, low-skilled workers have higher separation rates, they have lower matching efficiency, and they have low, lower bargaining power. So what is the insight of the effect that I'm going to highlight? You have an expansionary monetary policy shock, policy shock that increases investment and all the components of aggregate demand. That because investment is, complement, is a complementary factor of uh, high-skill labor, that increases the relative demand for complementary and more fluid uh, high-skill labor, which of course increases the marginal productivity of capital, so that increases investment, which it, uh, in the second round increases against the demand for high-skill labor. So there is a multiplier loop, a demand amplification effect. Of course, uh, capital skill complementarity, complementarity, CSC, plus asymmetric such and much friction, the outcome is going to be a, an increase in the relative income of high-skilled workers versus low-skilled workers. That is, can be decomposed into a change in the skill premium, relative wages, and the change in the relative employment rates, a change in, in quantities. Uh, the, main, the main result is that the interaction of these features, capital skill complementarity and asymmetric uh, such and matching frictions, yields much stronger effects on the relative income shares than the sum of the two separate forces. So, for instance, in our theoretical model, we simulate again the effect of a one percentage point cut unexpected cut in the annualized interest rate, and we compare different outcomes. I want to highlight the purple uh, dashed line is when both features are relevant, capital skill complementarity and asymmetric search and matching. You see that the relative income share of the high skill relative to the low skill increases by 1.5 percentage points and then goes down. Uh, whereas when we consider this effect separately, only capital skill complementarity or only uh, asymmetric such a matching, the effects are much smaller and the sum of the two is, uh, is l l lower than the, than the interactive effect. When we, you confront this with the data, for instance, uh, with the U.S. data, uh, using information on uh, real wages and employment rates of people with uh, uh, workers with a college degree, uh, uh, non-completed college degree, and so on, what you find is that the predictions of the model uh, are supported by the data. So, for instance, this is again a cut in interest rates by one percentage point. The employment ratio increases by uh, 0.4 percentage points. This is even after 40 months, whereas the wage premium also increases by about 0.2 percentage points, even after 40 months. 
Finally, and I want to stop here, I just want to raise an issue for, for the subsequent discussion, which is also related to the issue of uh, job polarization and capital scheme complementarity, but this time with the slope of the price Felix curve. The idea is the following. The idea, look at this, uh, the, uh, the left-hand side graph. This is the slope of the Phillips curve, where inflation is a regress on unemployment, unemployment. So you should find a negative relationship. And this is a, a, eight-year periods from uh, 2002 to 2020 and as you see starting from 2010 the the elasticity becomes zero so the Phillips curve uh, gets completely flat on the right hand side uh, graph what you have is the decline in the share of routine jobs which have fallen by almost seven percentage points from 2002 to 2018 so the basic idea I was conveying before is that the, if the market for non-routine jobs is more fluid than the labor for routine jobs, think of routine jobs, clerical jobs, production jobs, etc., fluidity is going to make the, the curve much flatter. And here I quote a couple of papers which explore this possibility. And I think uh, that's all for, uh, from my side. Thank you very much for, for uh, keeping to the time and uh, for, for the excellent uh, first contribution. So n now I turn to Antonella. Can you hear me now? Perfect, thank you. Okay, very good. So first of all, thanks for the invitation uh, and for the great you know, opportunity to participate to this panel. So, so what I would like to do today is to, to share some remarks about how to best assess uh, Slack in the labor market. And, and I've been inspired by the greatest emphasis that has been put in both academic uh, circles and policy circles in the US uh, regarding you know, measuring slack. And this is likely uh, due to the explicit dual mandate of the Fed. So, <clears throat> oh. sure, sorry about that. Okay, so, so um, rephrasing what, um, Philip said at the, at the very beginning, assessing labor market under utilization is key to monetary policy. And therefore, time, and in particular, timely and uh, reliable measures of labor market lack are then are key inputs to monetary policy for two main reasons. First, because they provide a measure of the cyclical position of the economy and thus permit the assessment of the, you know, whether the short run inflationary pressures are indeed tolerable in presence of a trade off. And they also provide a signal of demand-related inflationary pressures. Now, historically, uh, policymakers and academics focus on the unemployment rate as the primary measures of underutilization in labor market. However, it is well known that uh, the unemployment rate may not capture all the margins of labor market lack. And indeed, in its um, uh, statement of the longer-run goals of monetary policy, the Fed explicitly writes that in assessing um, its maximum employment, it considers a wide range of indicators. And the famous, the famous uh, Yellen's uh, labor market dashboard is an example of this strategy. Now, the first point is that the, the unemployed are not the only uh, job seekers. Uh, the fact that we observe large flows from non-participation to employment and even larger flows from employment to employment is a signal of uh, some unmet demand for employment or effective labor supply that is not captured by the unemployment rate. The second point is that the pool of job seeker is heterogeneous as, um, and it is heterogeneous in particular in terms of their uh, likelihood to find jobs um, which is then, um, you know, a proxy for, you know, their effective labor supply or search intensity. 
uh, marginally attached workers, for example, discouraged workers, less likely to find jobs than uh, the short-term unemployed. And the unemployed themselves are heterogeneous uh, in terms of demographics, duration, and history. For example, long-term unemployed workers are well known to have lower job finding rates than short-term unemployed workers. So, so this implies that simple counts of uh, the number of job seekers, for example, um, as you know, some measures of alternative, some alternative measures of labor market underutilization that are computed by the BLS, uh, the U4, U5, U6 um, um, unemployment rates will, which simply sums different categories of job seekers from uh, unemployment and from outside the labor force, we fail to capture this heterogeneity in propensity to search, in propensity to work. Now, to illustrate the importance of um, accounting for search intensity, let me compare the evolution of the unemployment rate in the, in the US and in the euro area during the COVID recessions. So if you look at the first plot, you see that the unemployment rate in the US increased by more than 10 percentage points, while in the euro area, the unemployment rate at the onset of the COVID crisis only increased by 1.5 percentage points. Now, the main reason for, for this is, is not, you know, a different, uh, you know, fundamental uh, uh, behavior of the labor market is simply that um, official statistics report temporary unemployed differently in the US and in the Euro area in particular, temporary layoff are employed absent from work in, uh, in the Euro area while they are counted as unemployed in, uh, in the US. Now, uh, so essentially they are given a zero weight in the euro area uh, as if their search intensity was zero while they're given a weight equal to one in the, in the, in the US unemployment rate as if they were searching with the same intensity as other unemployed workers, permanently unemployed workers. Now, if we, if we construct two counterfactual rates that you know, bring these two measures closely together in terms of definition, essentially by subtracting temporary laid off from the US unemployment rate or uh, adding temporary laid off uh, to the Euro area unemployment rate, then we, we observe a quite striking result because in, in, in that case, the, the increase in the, in the unemployment rate becomes extremely close uh, in the two cases. Now, um, what, what is the key takeaway is, uh, is that actually neither of these scenarios is, is likely to be appropriate because what would be appropriate is to weight temporary aid of workers by their actual search intensity, which is not going to be zero, uh, but definitely is going to be below that of other unemployed given that these workers have the option to, to uh, go back to their previous work. So um, how can we construct a measure of effective job seekers, uh, a comprehensive and synthetic measure? We, we can do it by doing two things. First of all, to consider the entire population of effective job seekers. And second, by weighting them by their search intensity. Now, the challenge, of course, is measuring the search intensities and different approaches have been proposed in the literature. But, um, one particular approach is the one followed by Abram, Altivanger, and Randall in a, in a recent paper, where they infer the relative job, the relative search intensity from ex post outcomes, from ex post transition rates to employment, from job finding rates, and using CPS data to track the flows to employment by the initial state, also adjusting by demographics. Um, so what they, they do, they estimate uh, relative search intensity for 22 groups, 13 among the unemployed, seven among the non-participants, and two among the unemployed. And here is, you know, their results, which show a very wide range of relative search intensity across the different 22 groups. So what I did is to, to build, to construct in the spirit of um, Abram and Cotters, an admittedly very rough measure of effective job seekers for the Euro area using you know, the available data. Uh, I don't have, uh, as of now, the microdata. I will in the future. 
And in particular, I consider, so, so the available data is 2006 quarter one to 2021 quarter one. I consider only six labor market states, two among the unemployed, three among the non-participants, so it's short-term and long-term unemployed, uh, among the non-participants seeking, uh, but not immediately available, available, but not immediately seeking, and then others, and finally, the employed. And then I compute the relative transition rate and weight these stocks, and finally, uh, normalize by the, um, by the working age population to obtain a rate of effective job seekers. Now, let me show you the results. Uh, and let me mention that, of course, there are some European relate, Euro area related caveats in the construction of these measures. Uh, we already mentioned job retention schemes, but on top of that, also distinguishing between fixed term versus open ended contract, which workers in, in you know, these two contracts might be extremely relevant. Now, in terms of results, uh, what we find is the following. So in the figure, you see the uh, rate of effective job seekers against the official unemployment rate, shifting the scale so as to you know, align the, the means. And what we find, what I find is that the, the two series are, are you know, highly correlated and both counter-cyclical, but they have very different uh, volatility in particular the uh, job seekers rate is, is much less volatile with a standard deviation, which is 35% of the standard deviation of the unemployment rate. Now, why is the volatility dampened? Um, there are two main, there are many reasons for that. One reason is that, um, and here I mentioned the, the, the two principal reasons. One reason is upsetting changes in the cyclical composition of searchers. During a recessions, you are going to have more unemployed job seekers, but less employed job seekers and the opposite in expansion. The other important component to dampening the volatility, uh, it's, it's the, the downweighting of the long-term unemployed, which essentially, because they have a much lower weight than the short-term unemployed is going to, and both components are, are you know, accounting with a weight one in the standard unemployment rate, this is going to reduce mechanically the volatility from this component. Now, uh, the next question uh, I ask is whether the unemployment rate is indeed, uh, you know, an imperfect signal of the true measure, uh, what, you know, I take to be the true measure of SLAT, the effective job seekers rate. And uh, the point is that if uh, job seekers of each of the, you know, if all the components of the job seekers rate would move together with the unemployment rate, then it would not matter to account for them separately, because the implication, of course, for wage and prices through the lens of a Phillips curve would be exactly the same. But of course, so the first thing is that this is not possible, because uh, in this measure, if, if any one category increases, then uh, this is going to translate into a decrease in, in the other categories. But still, to explore whether, you know, quantitatively, whether the unemployment rate is an imperfect signal of the job seekers rate, I standardize the two measures and compare them. And what, what I find is that U is indeed an imperfect signal in a, in a quantitatively meaning uh, manner. And in particular, it underestimates slack during the recession while it overestimates during uh, booms. So while, uh, let, let me, let me um, um, not go into the, the reason for, for this, but just mentioning that the, the story during the, the, um, the great financial crisis is a very different one than the story during the, the COVID crisis. So, so what the last thing I wanted to do, but maybe I can, uh, given that I'm uh, out of time, uh, I can uh, talk about that during the, the discussion uh, later on. So let me stop here. Thank you, Antonella. And no doubt uh, there will be time to come back uh, to, to this uh, final dimension. Uh, so with that, let me turn to Jean-Luca. So over to you, Jean-Luca. All right, thank you. 
thank you very much for uh, for the invitation, uh, Philip. I'm uh, I'm delighted to be uh, part of the part of this panel. So um, so both uh, Juan and uh, Antonella uh, mentioned um, in their presentations uh, Hank model. So what I want to um, um, do in this uh, ten minutes that uh, that I have available. I want to sort of uh, reflect a little bit on what we have learned from uh, these new class of models uh, so far. Um, so I want to start uh, from the observation that um, central banks uh, employ uh, a suite of very different models to uh, inform uh, monetary policy decisions, uh, mainly with two objectives. Uh, the first one is that of uh, forecasting in the short or medium run, and the main tool is uh, uh, vector progressive models. But they also need models to interpret the data and run policy counterfactuals. Um, and the main tool that they use are uh, structural D DSG models. Now, traditionally, these DSG models are representative agent uh, models, so models with a representative household, um, or models with very limited uh, heterogeneity, so uh, uh, models with like two types of agents, for example, a spender or a saver, or a borrower uh, and a saver. Uh, so I was very uh, uh, glad to read in one of the <coughs> excellent uh, background papers uh, prepared by the ECB staff um, for this uh, uh, strategy review, uh, the review of macroeconomic modeling in the Euro system, um, that given the achievements in the academic and literature, central banks should venture into this uh, new era of modeling and advance in the empirical validation of those models. So what are these uh, Hank models? So, um, um, oops, sorry. <laughs> um, so the uh, Hank uh, stands for um, uh, heterogeneous agent mm. and new Keynesian. So, uh, the uh, uh, NK stands for the New Keynesian block uh, of the model, which is essentially um, um, two equations, two equilibrium relationships. The first one is the Phillips curve that summarizes the production uh, structure of the model. And the second one is the monetary policy rule that summarizes the uh, sort of the, the behavior and choices of the central bank. The HA stands for uh, heterogeneous agents. Um, and here uh, it's the novelty because these models replace the aggregate Euler equations of the IS curve with modern theory of consumption and saving, essentially the uh, buffer stock uh, model. Um, so households in this model are heterogeneous uh, either ex ante because of you know, different preferences, for example, different, uh, different discount factors, risk aversion, um, or skills and occupation as in, uh, in one uh, presentation. Uh, and exposed uh, because of different labor market trajectories, uh, as in uh, Antonella's presentation, where you have some workers who are employed, that are unemployed, that are out of the labor force, um, and so on. Uh, but the key thing is that there is imperfect resharing uh, among, among workers. Um, so it's a deviation from complete <coughs> market, which is sort of the aggregation results that leads to the representative agent uh, representation. So what emerges is an equilibrium distribution of income, consumption, and wealth that kind of resembles in the data. And at the cost of uh, oversimplifying a little bit, these models are basically three groups of households with kind of endogenous mobility uh, among them. You have the hand-to-mouth households, where kind of low liquidity and high margin of risk to consume, a kind of a middle class uh, for which the precautionary saving motive is very strong because they want to stay away from the credit limit uh, to smooth consumption. And then you have the wealthy, which are kind of the high net worth uh, individuals. So what, what, what do we learn um, from this, uh, what do we learn from uh, this, this kind of class of models uh, so far? So um, I'm going to argue that uh, uh, we learn uh, four main lessons. The first one is about the transmission uh, mechanism of, uh, of monetary policy. So the transmission mechanism of monetary policy to the real economy is different in this class of models. Uh, in the representative agent models, uh, the key uh, channel of uh, transmission is intratemporal substitution. So the central bank cuts interest rates and households uh, they consume more and they save less. Okay, that's kind of the standard intertemporal substitution channel. In heterogeneous agent models, um, uh, there are a host of uh, uh, um, additional effects. So the intertemporal substitution is still there, but there, th this effect is dominated by a number of other indirect effects that take place through the general equilibrium forces. So changes in labor income and employment, asset prices, mortgage rates, revaluation effects on debt, and even fiscal policy, as I will uh, explain later. Okay, so uh, what we learn is the centrality of indirect general equilibrium channel, and this is even truer for uh, unconventional monetary policy, um, which by definition works through basically uh, asset uh, asset prices. So, what what does it mean for the practice of, of monetary policy? It means that there are a variety of intermediate fa intermediate factors that are sort of outside the direct uh, uh, control of central banks. 
uh, and that depend on uh, uh, institutional design, uh, market structures, and a number of other factors which are uh, very country specific. Just think about the housing market, how different the housing market is across countries, okay? So that makes, from the point of view of Hank models, that makes the job of the monetary authority much harder because most of the effects of monetary policy occur exactly through kind of uh, uh, market market equilibrium in, in various uh, in various markets. Um, the second lesson that we learn is that uh, there are um, uh, uh, several sources of amplification of monetary policy relative to representative agent moment. Um, uh, the first one is what uh, 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 one called the redistribution channel, right? So let me explain this channel. So consider a monetary policy shock that expands output to GDP. The key observation is that the incidence of such expansions varies across the distribution. Okay, so the micro data, as you can say here, you can see in this plot, uh, the micro data uh, tell us that uh, the elasticity, the sensitivity of individual income to aggregate income is much higher at the extremes of the distribution relative to the, to the middle. Okay, so uh, at the bottom, it, it's basically about uh, unemployment, uh, the fluctuation in unemployment, and at the top is about essentially uh, performance based pay. Uh, which is very sensitive to the to the cycle. Uh, so amplification occurs when sort of this redistribution of income uh, <laughs> occurs from households with low marginal price to consume towards households with high marginal price to consume, because this redistribution increases and expands aggregate aggregate spending. But also uh, when the distribution occurs from households with low propensity to take risk from those with high propensity to take risk, because that reduces the risk premium, makes capital cheaper, and increases investment in capital that also in turn increases aggregate demand. Okay, so these are kind of this is the, kind of the first the first channel. The second channel has to do with the cyclicality of labor market risk, right? So basically unemployment risk. As you can see in this in this figure, in a recession, unemployment risk goes up clearly uh, across the, the population. Um, and uh, that leads to a stronger precautionary saving motive. So kind of you know, saving for, for the rainy day. So this increase in, in precautionary saving further uh, generates uh, a, a, a further fall in spending and employment uh, and sort of uh, uh, induces a kind of a downward spiral. By reverting this downward spiral, the effects of monetary policy can be amplified relative to, say, a representative agent model where uh, there's no precautionary saving motive, no heterogeneity, uh, kind of nothing, nothing of, of, of this sort, if you like. So, um, oh, sorry, that's my, it's a bit flickering my mouse today. Um, the third source of uh, uh, amplification has to do with the uh, fiscal uh, response of the fiscal authority. Um, so these are here what I what I did. I just uh, uh, plotted basically the uh, I just wrote the the budget constraint of the of the government, and um, you can see that kind of a decline in the interest rate um, uh, kind of frees up uh, some resources because it reduces the uh, the cost of servicing debt uh, for the government. So. Um, how the fiscal authority responds to a monetary policy shock is going to matter in a non-Ricardian world, okay? In particular, the size of these extra resources are going to be a function of many things. So in particular, the maturity structure of debt. The shorter is the maturity structure, the bigger are the extra resources which are available uh, for the government to uh, possibly uh, distribute uh, to the household sector. And where in the income distribution these uh, extra resources end up is going to determine amplification. Again, if they're targeted to the uh, high margin of risk to consume households, that is going to increase aggregate demand. Okay. Third lesson, third lesson, um, uh, monetary policy has an impact on income and wealth inequality. Uh, so what, what do the uh, Hank models tell us? Uh, they tell us that uh, monetary policy is redistributive and that matters for the transmission. So at the very least, you know, it's important for central banks to understand and, to, and take into account heterogeneity, inequality, and the distribution to um, uh, deepen their understanding about the transmission mechanism. But more to the point, in this class of models, um, every stabilization policy has redistributive implications, and any redistributive policy uh, can stabilize or destabilize the economy. Okay, so there's really like a a, a, a very uh, intimate relationship between stabilization and redistributive policies. Uh, now, another thing that you learn and you see immediately from these models is that fiscal policy is much better suited to redistribute and ensure risks uh, on the household side because it can be targeted much more accurately, right? And um, 
this is uh, something that emerges very clearly, very clearly from this model. Now, the key problem of monetary policy, of uh, I'm sorry, of, of fiscal policy, uh, is that um, uh, it is uh, um, often it it's it, 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 it sort of plagued with kind of institutional delays and political compromise. And, and so because of these delays, often the kind of the first response falls on the shoulder of the monetary authority. Uh, in this sense, for example, if the Eurozone strengthened automatic stabilizers and improved their design, the monetary authority could fulfill its mission uh, better. And speaking of mission, uh, going back to uh, one's point um, that he, he, he made in one of his slides, should the monetary policy uh, uh, authority be concerned with inequality. Well, here you have kind of these two almost uh, polar opposite um, uh, responses from the two uh, major central banks in the world. The Fed says yes, explicitly aiming for an inclusive recovery. The ECB answer is almost it's like like a, a no unless it interferes with price stability. Now, I um, I don't feel like dissenting with this uh, the, the ECB view. Uh, in a way, uh, for a number of reasons. The first one is that uh, institutions with narrowly defined missions have, uh, I think, many, many strengths. Uh, you know, specialization, we know that leads to higher productivity. So specialization is a good thing also in institutions, in my view. Uh, the second thing is that, uh, you know, there are these secular trends in the income distribution, which are shaped by very strong market forces like technology and globalization that are impossible to revert uh, with uh, monetary policy or even fiscal policy. You know, you can do, uh, you can have small deviations. There are interesting interactions like in one's paper, but at the end of the day, the secular forces are going to determine the long run trends. So perhaps one little compromise could be, you know, given the, the, the many uh, tools uh, now more than ever that are available to central banks, uh, a compromise could be to aim for price stabilization in the most uh, equitable way. You know, so kind of choosing the instruments uh, that uh, that has the uh, smallest uh, implications for for inequality. And in 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 my uh, last uh, thirty seconds, literally, let me let me uh, talk about the fourth lesson. So the fourth lesson is very important, I think, and it is that you know what what we what what the uh, uh, what the Hank uh, literature tells us is that. Uh, uh, central banks are kind of new data requirements. So granular micro data are essential to the mission of the ECB. They're really essential in the, any central bank. So the Household Finance and Consumption Survey is a great first step, is an awesome really data set, but it's uh, it's small and ideally in the larger sample size to explore all the dimensions of heterogeneity that, that Philip mentioned uh, at, at the beginning and try to understand which ones really matter. It's a repeated cross section and you really need the longitudinal dimension. Uh, and you also uh, need uh, better coverage of the top of the distribution. And these surveys have a hard time reaching the, the wealthy, the high net worth individuals. So one can think of complementing the HFCS with additional data sources like administrative uh, data, pro uh, public or proprietary data, for example, bank, bank transaction data, and link them to social security number. Also, I think what is needed is real time or high frequency data. You know, the, I think the, the, the COVID recession uh, um, made it very clear how important it is to have like real time high frequency data to really monitor uh, the evolution of the of the crisis in real time and try to understand you know uh, who uh, policy monetary and fiscal policy should target if possible. Um, you know, concluding, what is needed, I think, uh, you know, the, the the ECB has great data on banks balance sheet, on firms balance sheet, but I think where it's lacking is on a rich data set providing a, a, a comprehensive uh, household finance pulse uh, for the uh, Eurozone. Okay, thank you, Jean-Luca. I mean, the way uh, I think, uh, having listened for the last half hour, uh, is it's been a great introduction to the complexity, uh, the richness, but I also think the advances uh, that the academic world has made uh, in addressing this, this topic of how, in, of how to take account of heterogeneity along these many dimensions in understanding the, the interaction of monetary policy and employment. Uh, in passing, I'm not going to develop this topic, but as a side comment, uh, someone somewhere should deeply think about whether, in fact, the difference in mandates across central banks uh, really is fundamental to this question. Because by and large, uh, I think the divine coincidence element where typically under a lot of configurations, uh, what is needed uh, to bring inflation from below towards 2% typically is also pro-employment, uh, maybe goes a long way. 
uh, and also in terms of uh, with the correct measure of slack, taking into account the different search intensities, the different participation rates of different groups, you know, it may, maybe it, there's a lot more similarity than dissimilarity. Now, uh, I again encourage the, the, uh, the, the audience to, to, to raise your, your virtual hands uh, to, to join uh, in, in the discussion. Uh, but w while that has taken place, let me come back to the panel members. Uh, and maybe, again, because we, we went through a lot there, there's a lot covered, uh, but it might be helpful uh, to look for some uh, bottom lines. So I apologise for being a bit reductive here, uh, but, but it's helpful maybe sometimes to look for a bottom line. So my bottom line for, for each of you is really a, a two-parter. One is directional. Um, let's say I'm traditional, I'm conservative. I say, I, don't, I appreciate this work, but I don't want to, 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 to learn too much. Uh, how far wrong am I going to go by taking a representative agent approach? And in particular, will I get the direction wrong? Will I be loosening policy when I should be tightening or vice versa? So do, 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 does this approach ever come up with scenarios which tell you uh, not only are you calibrating wrong, be actually moving in the wrong direction. So it, that's one basic reductive question. A second reductive question is, uh, Jean-Luc mentioned some amplification forces, but is everything an amplification force or do some of the forces move as a, as a kind of dampening force? So is there any kind of universal principle that allowing for heterogeneity amplifies the effectiveness of monetary policy or diminishes it? Or I'm going to guess maybe the answer is going to be it all depends. Uh, but with that, uh, whether again, uh, we each panel member maybe take one or two minutes either to take that on, or maybe if you kind of felt you didn't have time to make all the points you wanted to make, uh, you can come back to some of the, the, the your, your interventions that you would, you would like to get across. So uh, over, to, over to you, Juan. But if you can wait for the, for the microphone to catch up with you. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, so regarding your first question about the implications of ignoring heterogeneity, I think uh, uh, this is going to be very costly because, uh, of course, the propagation mechanism is, is, is different in the, in, the, in, the, in the representative agent model. Interest rates are going to change uh, equilibrium interest rates are going to go up, whereas uh, following expansionary mo uh, monetary policy, monetary shock, whereas in the in the hand model is going to go down because all this middle class who is worried about precautionary saving will save more uh, in, the, in a recession. Sorry. Uh, so the the implications change, and uh, and I think uh, uh, ignoring them it's. Um, is, is problematic. Uh, with respect to the amplification versus dampening effects, uh, my impression is that there are forces that uh, 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 push towards the dampening effect and forces that uh, push towards the amplification effects. Um, and, and identifying those sources uh, uh, it's absolutely crucial. In the presentation, we uh, several illustrations were were pointed out. Uh, uh, so the nature of uh, what sort of capital, how does it combine with the various labor force, with la 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 skill, uh, skill labor skills, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Also, uh, uh, I think in, in Antonella's presentation, there was this issue of uh, how to count the search intensity, which could be a dampening, uh, if we do it correctly, it could be a dampening effect rather than an amplification effect. Like, for example, if we ignore the, the, the long-term unemployed, which are counted as unemployment, but of course they don't exert any downward pressure on wages. So I don't have a I don't have a, a single response to to both of your of your queries, but uh, my, my point is that uh, we should not uh, disregard hard models. They are rich and they uh, they, they they bring uh, new issues onto the onto the table. 
and, and that the amplification forces are probably more important than dampening forces. Thank you. Uh, over, to, over to you, Antonella. So, uh, again, if you can wait for the microphone. Okay. Thanks. Okay, so my, my take on, on your two questions is that, uh, yes, the, so the, the chance of moving in the, in the, in the wrong direction is, is definitely there, given the, the difference in terms of the, of the mechanism. And, uh, and the answer to the second question, you know, whether, uh, you know, amplification relative to dampening, it's also, yeah, it depends. It depends on, on which aspect are we focusing on. And and so so what I want to 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 argue is uh, you know I want to 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 sort of raise the following question which is related to this um, question Philip that you raised about you know uh, what what we learn and how do this model compare to representative agent model and 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 the point is whether you know these models are ready for you know to be used for policy analysis from, you know, to be incorporated into the toolkit of uh, central banks. And there, I, I, you know, and I would like to also know the opinion of the other panelists. I think that, um, you know, one issue is whether we should go for this, you know, fully fledged, continuous agent euthanasia model or rather you know, go in step and, and develop more tractable version or, or do this in tandem so that we can we can um, learn from the, the more tractable version, which, which um, you know, aspect, uh, despite being, you know, realistic, they, they, they may not matter too much for the transmission of shocks and for the transmission of policy. Um, so, so I think that's one important um, uh, you know, if I, if I look at, you know, at, at, the, at the slide that Gianluca uh, presented to us, uh, clarifying all the possible transmission mechanism and, you know, additional transmission mechanism associated to inequality in, in the presentation of, of one, I, I you know, uh, my, my impression is first that no model, I guess, is going to incorporate at the same time all this uh, you know, mechanism that the, the the interplay of those uh, different mechanisms going to depend very much on uh, you know the calibration underlying assumption about uh, distribution of uh, incomes, uh, and uh, so uh, the point is, uh, you know, do we know enough, uh, or do we have uh, can, can we? Use are, are these models ready for to be used? Or rather, we should go in step and uh, use uh, you know develop other models uh, that are more tractable to get intuition to, but also to 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 spread the knowledge to be used for teaching. So I think uh, uh, which is uh, something that um, uh, it's it's uh, extremely important and and uh, you know the last thing in, in this. Uh, direction I, I would like to say is that I, I I suspect you know there has been so much progress in terms of, of uh, solving this model you know numerical methodologies to solving these models even though I think the literature hasn't settled on one yet but I suspect that very soon there will be some you know available uh, code like it happens for the Bayesian uh, you know estimated uh, DSG models where you can uh, you know, uh, put into the code uh, a hang model and get, you know, your, your, so are we ready for that or should we first, uh, uh, you know, first um, uh, develop some knowledge? Yeah. Th th thank you. Uh, Jean-Luca? Yes. Um, <laughs> I think Juan and Antonella uh, were very exhaustive, so I'm going to be uh, sort of brief. Uh, let me start from your second question, Philip, the question about application versus dampening. Um, I think, you know, to, to see um, uh, whether there, there, there would be a possibility of dampening in this model, um, the easiest example is uh, uh, the following, okay? So think about like a, a, a cut in the interest rate. 
uh, and um, think about like two major effects that this has on the macroeconomy. The first one is that of kind of expanding uh, aggregate demand and employment, wages, reducing unemployment, and therefore kind of affecting the lower end of the income distribution, which is the um, uh, which is sort of the distribution, uh, the partial distribution with households that have a higher marginal price to consume, and that type of distribution goes towards amplification. But a reduction in um, in the policy rates also leads to an increase in asset prices, and that's then to um, increase the the wealth or you know increase mm -hmm. capital gains, mostly for those at the top distribution, which are individuals with low uh, marginal price to consume, uh, very low marginal price to consume, much lower than the hand to mouth households, and that would go in the direction of dampening the, the shock. So uh, try to understand whether. Uh, you know, conventional, especially unconventional monetary policy, uh, mostly affects one tail of the, or the, the upper tail or the lower tail of the distribution is key to understand <clears> whether <throat> at the end of the day there would be amplification or dampening. Um, to your first question, um, I agree with uh, Antonella that, you know, the step from representative agent to like a two agent model, so a model where you have basically some uh, hand-to-mouth, high marginal price to consume households, and then the rest of the model is essentially a uh, representative agent model. So models that we that have been used in central banks for uh, for for decades is a small step, even computationally, also conceptually, is a small step. So that is certainly a step that is not costly and that captures many of the forces that are in more general uh, heterog heterogeneous agent uh, models. What what these models? There are a number of things that these models don't capture. Okay, so uh, two important uh, elements, in my view. One is that uh, in the data, the share of uh, households that are hand to mouth, so they are constrained, they are very low liquidity, is very is very cyclical. It's very is very cyclical. It's counter cyclical. It goes up in recessions. So all the effects associated with that uh, uh, group of households. Uh, is um, is sort of are endogenous to the evolution of the cycle, which is something that you don't have in uh, two agent models. The other, which is probably the most important, is that these models don't have a precautionary saving uh, mechanism. Or if you want to be really precise, they would have it, they have it if you solve the model globally with respect to aggregate fluctuation, aggregate shocks. But they don't have a precautionary saving motive with respect to idiosyncratic risk, which is the main source of precautionary saving. And uh, that, I think, is really uh, an important uh, economic force uh, that must be taken into consideration when thinking about uh, you know, um, aggregate fluctuations and the effects of, of monetary policy. Uh, so there is, yes, something that we lose. Uh, whether uh, the policy prescription in terms of directions are, uh, will be wrong that I don't know, and um, honestly, I would be surprised if, uh, if you know, if, if uh, a two agent model would, would get it completely wrong. Uh, but um, you know, fundamentally, I think that you know, central banks should use uh, an array of models. Uh, they should keep using representative agent and two agent models, but also uh, they should add to the, their their toolkit uh, these class of models because uh, you can always learn. You know, and I think that what also is important is to kind of converge you know, between academia and institutions on a language, on a common language. And uh, using these uh, sort of models in central banks and, and institutions would help us converge on a common language. And uh, that would, I think, uh, would be uh, like a, a ground for very, very prolific interaction uh, between uh, uh, you know, institutions and academia. Very good. Thank you, John luca Thank you, all of you. Uh, and now I'm going to turn uh, to uh, a question from the audience. I'm very pleased that uh, Kristen Forbes has, uh, has volunteered to make a comment or ask a question. So Kristen, over to you. Thanks very much, Philip. So these present presentations provided a really nice overview of the different channels by which monetary policy could affect inequality in employment. But I was wondering if the panelists could discuss whether the different forms of monetary policy had different effects in their framework. A couple of you hinted that they might, for example, Gianluca, you just talked about conventional monetary policy to differentiate the effects from unconventional. Um, but more specifically, I was hoping I could try to nail you down on whether the frameworks we used could give us information on whether if, say, a central bank wanted to provide a certain amount of stimulus is measured by the impact on inflation, would providing that stimulus through lower rates 
have more or less impact on inequality than providing the same stimulus through QE, or particularly relevant for today, uh, if a central bank decides it needs to remove a certain amount of stimulus because of concerns about price stability, would removing that stimulus through shrinking the balance sheets have a different effect on inequality and unemployment than removing a comparable amount of stimulus by tightening through raising interest rates? Th th thank you, Kristen. So um, I guess any or all of you could take that, but uh, uh, let me just see if there's uh, Juan or Antonella or Gianluca. Okay, Juan. Uh, so, you go ahead? Please. Uh, so, so, Juan, if you, if you go ahead. I think the implications are, are going to be... Uh, the implications will be different. Uh, for instance, uh, in terms of uh, access to financial markets, and so on, the effect of quantitative easing and conventional monetary policy is going to be quite different from uh, conventional monetary policy. And, and therefore, uh, the, the, uh, in your language, the, the, the dampening effect of, uh, of uh, quantitative easing, of course, uh, were eventually corrected when, when recovery is underway, uh, should be much stronger than the amplification effects of uh, standard monetary policy. That would be my short reply. Th thank you. So, so let me just cross-check if either Antonella or Gianluca wants to add. Just, just very quickly. Um, so, 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 so yes, definitely there's been a debate on, on you know, whether uh, uh, Unconventional monetary policy has contributed to raising inequality through the effects it has on uh, asset prices. And I think that, um, uh, I mean, I, I, I will let Gianluca talk about that because actually that was the last point of his slides, you know, that one way to, to care about inequality is precisely by, by, you know, which while keeping, you know, the goals uh, limited, is to to choose tools, uh, different tools in 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 uh, taking into account that they do have, uh, in certain dimension, the same effects on um, inequality. I would say labor markets, but in other dimension, they have different effects. As the prices. Okay, th th thank you, uh, Jean Luc. Do you want to add yes. any? Please. Yeah, and no, just very quickly, I was going to say precisely what Antonella uh, said. So let me just uh, repeat it. So, so I think that you know, within technically, just speaking technically, within the uh, the, the technical framework of uh, of this class of models, uh, I think it is possible to uh, say design a, um, a certain amount of quantitative easing, so say purchases of of certain uh, less liquid assets, say or or even stocks or equity that has exactly the same effect on, say, aggregate GDP, uh, aggregate income, or aggregate employment than uh, a certain, say, uh, you know, like a, a 25 basis point cut in the interest rate. That is possible. What is going to be different is uh, precisely uh, what are the implications across the distribution. So who gains and who loses? Uh, that, those, the winners and losers are going to be different uh, across these two, um, uh, these two policies. And, uh, and again, uh, I, you know, I do think that uh, not as a, a kind of a main uh, objective, but maybe as a, as, you know, as a secondary um, uh, uh, sort of precept, if you like, of the conduct of monetary policy, you know, one could uh, think that, uh, you know, price stability could try to be achieved in a way that is uh, the most uh, equitable possible um, with respect to, you know, the distribution of, of income and wealth. Um, so choosing the instrument that uh, achieves the objective with the limited, uh, most limited impact on, say, inequality. That could be, um, you know, a compromise, if, you know, such a compromise is possible, obviously. Very good. So, so I, I would like to thank all of the panelists. The way, the way I think about th this session is, it's very much a, a progress report. Uh, I've no doubt that uh, central banks, especially here at ECB, will indeed uh, be making more use of these models. And as the academic literature progresses, uh, so will we. I just want to make one point about big data. 
Uh, actually, uh, just before the pandemic, we launched a consumer expectation survey. It doesn't deliver everything John Luca would like, but we've been learning a lot. And actually, it passes through to policymaking pretty quickly every month now when we find out that the attitude of consumers to the uh, income windfalls they've received, uh, to the fear of unemployment, differs so much across different groups in a systematic way. So that very basic dimension of understanding consumer behaviour is now greatly enriched at the ECB uh, through this uh, uh, pan-European consumer Expe expectation survey that, that the, our staff uh, now are leading. So with that, uh, let me uh, turn back over to Claire. Thank you, Mr. Lane, for some excellent moderation. And thank you to all of the speakers for their contributions too. I think it will have been very well received by the participants. Participants, you should have just received a link to a very short survey. We'd really value your feedback. So if you could take a few minutes to fill it in now, it would be much appreciated. We're going to take a break. We'll be back at 17.45 Central European time when we'll be joined by four of the world's leading central bankers. See you then. Bye. Climate change is one of the biggest economic risks confronting Europe this century and the rest of the world for that matter. The ECB has been at the forefront in responding to the crisis the pandemic has fueled. Now, hopefully we can begin to think about what the economy might look like after. Bonjour, I'm Mel Vaille, I'm 24 years old and I'm from France. Salut, my name is Adrian Flynn. I'm 31 years old and I am from Romania. Guten Tag, my name is Ilya Kantorovic, I'm 29 years old and I am from Germany. I'm interested in bank risk and my work explores the design of bank regulation to build a more financially stable world and to prevent future financial crises. My research interests are in macroeconomics with a focus on energy, climate change and inequality. I'm interested in the differences countries exhibit in the share of non-performing loans and the varying size and duration of the increase in non-performing loans during recessions. current research focuses on the corporate bond market. I study how investor heterogeneity impacts market liquidity, bond pricing, and ultimately firms' financing conditions. In my work, we show that in the Eurozone, bond finance firms react more strongly to monetary policy action than bank finance firms. My paper explores fire sale risk and contagion originating from collateralized loan obligation or CLO managerial contracts. In this project, I study how to accurately measure monetary policy from the European Central Bank, considering the relevance of government bond yield spreads in the Eurozone. 